Media is powerful. It can change a culture. It can change a whole generation. It can impact the entire globe. Two years ago, Shalom World TV was a dream. Today, it's a reality. A commercial-free, high-definition television network broadcasting from the United States of America, reaching 375 million English-speaking people around the globe. We want to reach to the ends of the earth. Throughout the year, Shalom missionaries work day and night to accomplish this mission, to produce programs that evangelize the culture. What is wrong with Connor's Tonight on Seekers. I can make time for you. For divine knowledge. We want to continue this mission. We want to produce more programs to impact this generation positively. Will you be with us? Can you take a commitment of donating just $25 a month for the next 12 months? We assure you of our prayers. Visit shalomworld.org slash donate today. We thank you for your generosity. Believe it or not, somebody actually let us in into the pastoral center here of the Diocese of Stockton. Our purpose for the visit is to interview His Excellency Bishop Stephen Blair. Come with us now as we meet with His Excellency Bishop Stephen Blair. And so, Bishop Blair, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you, Joseph. One of the things that I wanted to mention, which I found very interesting, of course, is that you are the 12th of 14 children. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, my father had 14 children, and uh, every time, uh, but there were three wives. Every awesome. time that his wife died, he remarried. So his first family, there was one child, the second family, 10, and then uh, the third family, of which I was a part, there were three of us. I have to imagine that there was a joyful air in being a part of such a large family. Well, it was uh, always uh, a great feeling of being part of a large family. There were only three of us at home when I was growing up because uh, the middle family, they were more like, uh, the half-brothers and sisters were more like aunts and uncles. I see, I see. One of the things we love to, to touch upon in these interviews with our shepherds is the faith life of Stephen Blair the child. Tell us a little bit about maybe your prayer life as a little boy. Well, I was raised in a uh, very good Catholic uh, family. And uh, both my mother and father were good Catholics. And uh, from the time I was uh, a little kid, uh, I wanted to be a priest as really? far back as I uh, can remember and uh, so I always had that uh, always had that uh, desire and uh, uh, that's not to say later on when I got older that I didn't have other thoughts yes but um, as a child uh, I always loved going to church well now hypotheticals are, are interesting so I'd like to ask if you hadn't become a priest what do you think you would have been you know, I don't know. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I might have been a teacher. I might have studied law. I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I used to have interests in different things. What do you suppose was the genesis of that desire as, a, as a, even a young child to become a priest? Well, I think uh, I was raised in a family where there was great respect for the church and love for the church. Um, I think that uh, my parent, this, uh, my father anyway, always wanted a, a priest's son, uh, but there was never any kind of pressure on me or anything like that. But uh, there, there was just great respect. I had a, a half-sister who was a Holy Cross nun, so there was always respect for priests and religious in our family. Can you remember a specific instance in your life, maybe in your young uh adult years when you really knew and you had that sense of the calling 
to the priesthood? Was there a specific moment in time? Uh, I don't think I could uh, do that. I know evangelicals can always identify <laughs> moments of conversion, but uh, as Catholics, we can't always uh, pick out uh, these moments uh, because uh, we see the grace of God working along. So I'm all along through the journey, but so I'm, I'm not really sure. Uh, if there would be uh, one moment where uh, I, I, I was so sure that this was uh, what God was calling me to do. We see in 1967 on the website for the diocese a picture there of a, a young Stephen Blair. Uh, what are your fondest memories of those early days of or after having been ordained a priest? I was very blessed in my first assignment. I was uh, assigned to a, a wonderful parish, uh, very family-oriented. Uh, the pastor was an outstanding priest. In fact, often young priests were assigned, newly ordained priests were assigned uh, to him. And uh, so I had a, a wonderful uh, training in those five years. Uh, I. Um, uh, I, I was uh, able to be very involved in uh, religious education and at that time there was uh, the Christian family movement which were a lot of young couples who were very involved uh, as couples in uh, social justice issues in the community. To this day uh, I, I still keep in touch with many of them. In fact the, the oldest group that I was part of were having a reunion in a couple of weeks. Having then also then been named Bishop of the Diocese of Stockton by Pope John Paul II, what would you say has been the most rewarding part of the work as Bishop for the Diocese of Stockton? Well, I would have to let uh, people other than myself judge, I guess, what has been the most effective. But as far as what is uh, meaningful and rewarding to me, I have always loved uh, working with people. Uh, I love uh, celebrating the liturgy and preaching. I love being involved in uh, working with uh, uh, the poor in the uh, community. Along with that sort of uh, work that you mentioned you love so much working with the poor, you have served as chairman of the Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development for the USCCB. What has been your greatest achievement and satisfaction in that role? It would be hard for me to uh, say what uh, would be uh, an achievement, but I... How about the greatest challenge? Well, the greatest challenge, uh, you're, you're only in the position three years, and it takes you some time to get to know all the players because you're very involved with Congress and the White House, etc. So I found it very interesting. Uh, it was a high learning curve for me, uh, but the greatest challenge is uh, to try to bring uh, uh, the application of a gospel message to a political situation. And often you had very little time for a conversation. You'd meet with different leaders, but you'd only have a half hour and you'd just be getting into some kind of discussion and the time would be up. And uh, So I found the challenge uh, uh, especially where those that where you needed a little more time for explanation, those who understood it was quick and easy. Uh, but uh, it, it's not uh, it's not an easy process to bring the gospel to human situations. Right, right. Bishop Blair, you also served on the California Catholic Conference of Bishops on the Committee of Ecumenical Affairs. Now, most folks tend to think of ecumenical affairs only as between maybe Catholics and Protestants, but I'm sure it goes far beyond that. But for those who are uninitiated in what it means to be involved in ecumenical affairs, would you explain for folks what that means? Well, it actually was uh, with the National Bishops' Conference, oh. ecumenical and interreligious affairs. And ecumenical has to do with uh, the prayer of Christ that all be one. So uh, ecumenism uh, seeks to bring about uh, visible unity of all Christians. And interfaith has to do with those who are 
uh, not Christian. So it'd be relationships with uh, Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims. Uh, we had a special relationship, of course, with Jews because uh, we uh, consider Abraham uh, to be our father in faith. And so there's a, a very special relationship there. What would you say was your greatest satisfaction in being a part of that in terms of progress made, let's say, with, uh, with those uh, Christians that are non-Catholics? Well, I think uh, the, uh, the, the greatest uh, progress was made in establishing uh, the uh, Christian churches together, which was a new gathering of uh, Christian churches. Uh, Cardinal Keeler had laid the foundation for it, and it was when I was chairman that it actually materialized. Uh, uh, there were many ecumenical groups, but this was the first effort to bring together all the ecumen all the different Christian churches, not just uh, uh, Protestant, but uh, evangelical, and uh, to bring about a new gathering. And uh, so that was quite a. Uh, quite a success that that happened at that time. And is it fair to say that the, the objective is to find as much common ground as possible? Well, you want to find as much common ground as possible to build uh, unity, but you also want to engage in dialogue on the areas that uh, you, uh, where you do not find the unity to better understand uh, one another. So it's, uh, uh, the, the church has had dialogues with all the various uh, groups, including non-Christian groups, and uh, the whole idea is to uh, to get an understanding, and also uh, to build relationships. And uh, in Christian churches together, not only was it uh, uh, to uh, create these new bonds, but also to work together on uh, issues that would be of common uh, interest and concern. Now, speaking of matters of concern, very often the, um, the news speaks to us of uh, the challenges that are faced by the clash of different faiths and, uh, in particular. But in, instead of posing it in a negative, I'd like to pose it in the positive, and that is, what did you see that perhaps was for you the most uh, inspirational thing of maybe working with, let's say, with the Muslim community? I uh, actually didn't work too extensively uh, with the Muslim community. Uh, mostly we had established dialogues of which other bishops were chair. And uh, so I really didn't have uh, too much uh, interaction uh, with them, but uh, I did have uh, some uh, meetings in uh, Washington, D.C., and they were, they were excellent. Uh, we had a couple Emans who were uh, teaching at, uh, I think it was at either Fordham or Georgetown and, uh, and maybe Catholic University. And I was invited uh, uh, to the home one time of an Iman and it was a very beautiful and wonderful uh, experience. Has there been any effort, let's say locally on the diocesan level of maybe reaching out to the local Muslim community here? Uh, there have been some efforts here. Um, I don't think they've been uh, too extensive, but uh, there have been uh, some efforts. Uh, I think we have more uh, Sikhs in this area uh, than I'm, I'm really not sure how extensive the Muslim community is. Okay. Changing gears a little bit now, I'd heard that uh, there was talk of retirement, which to me sounded a little bit uh, uh, premature, but I, I understand that you've already reached your 75th? I have. Now, I don't know if you believe me, but I said to you that it didn't seem to me that you're a person that would have reached that age already. So, very good genes, Your Excellency. Oh, well, thank you. you. Look much <laughs> younger than, than 75. <laughs> but of course, something happens at that age, and that is that uh, you send in your letter to the Holy Father uh, asking for permission to retire. Tell us a, a little bit about that process and what that was like for you. Well, uh, I turned 75 on December the 22nd, and so I sent in uh, my letter uh, that day. Uh, you simply indicate that uh, you have reached the age of 75, and in accord with canon law, uh, you are requesting uh, to resign from the diocese. So I have not heard back yet. Um, and 
so I'll, I'll wait to hear. Until further notice. <laughs> Until further notice. Um, I, uh, uh, I have observed that a lot of the bishops who have sent in their letters who are around my age, uh, that it, uh, many of them have, uh, uh, have been in office for another year, year and a half, two years before a new bishop was appointed. What is that like emotionally to look at the prospect of coming to the end, I suppose, of an active uh, life of service to the church? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure uh, emotionally uh, how I feel, but uh, uh, I don't look at it as uh, an end of uh, life of service to the church. I look at it as the uh, end of my term of office. Um, I already am thinking about uh, what I would be doing as a, a priest or a bishop uh, after I retire. What have you been thinking that you would do with your time once uh, that point comes? Well, uh, th these are just all uh, ruminations in my mind, but I certainly would help out uh, in the diocese uh, as much as I can, helping in parishes. I think I, I, I like working with uh, older people and I've especially been involved with uh, uh, some, uh, some committees and work on end of life issues um, on the what we call whole person care and palliative care uh, really as a, as a Christian response to uh, the physician assisted suicide legislation. So I might continue uh, devoting some time uh, to that. I'm not quite sure uh, wh where uh, I, you know, would be giving all my time, but I think about some of some of those things. As you look into the future, and here we are in the 21st century, what would you say the greatest challenge is to the church? And by that, I mean the growth of the faith, the health, and the vibrancy of the faith. I think the um, one of the great challenges uh, for the church is uh, to help people see um, the significance of religious faith in our lives. I think a lot of people um, have uh, come to live a very secularized lives, not necessarily uh, seeing um, what is missing by not being a believer. I think that um, sometimes people's lives are filled with uh, so many um, interests that uh, may not actually get at uh, the deepest levels of why I am alive, why I am in this world. And um, I think many times they have the wrong, maybe uh, the word wrong is the maybe erroneous understandings of uh, the place of religious faith. And uh, I really think the challenge is to help people see the significance in their lives of following Christ. Now the flip side of that very same question is, what do you see that you look at when you look at the church today and say, that really bodes well, I think that that's gonna be a wonderful thing for the church. Well, I think that uh, Pope Francis has um, identified what is very important for the church today. Uh, he speaks a lot about accompanying people. And I think that's what we as a church have to do. I think we have to be with the people. We have to accompany them. It doesn't mean we agree with everything that people do, but it means we are there uh, with them, that we are walking with them, uh, that uh, we are there to help them see the significance of their lives. And uh, so I think that that's, um, I think that, um, I think that's of great importance today. Excellency, there are questions that are deceptively simple, 
but which I think open up uh, the possibility for so many insights and uh, so many places to go with the question. And this is one of them. Who is Jesus Christ to Bishop Blair? Well, uh, it's always hard to put into words uh, who Christ is uh, to us. Um, maybe it would help if I explained a little bit about the uh, my model as a bishop, which is alive for God in Christ Jesus, in which I try to live my life for God. And I try to do it in union with Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are, we follow Christ, but we are a Trinitarian uh, religion, so that we are, we are living for God. Uh, but Christ lives within us and we are in union with him. So, it, for me, uh, uh, Christ is the one uh, that I follow because he leads me to God his Father. And um, I, I uh, try to meditate every day uh, on um, what Christ says in the scriptures. Uh, I try to listen intently. Uh, to what uh, to what the Lord Jesus is saying to me. So uh, I think um, who he is to me, he's the one I, I follow. And um, maybe uh, it could be expressed as uh, I dedicate my life uh, to following him. And, and then uh, because it is Trinitarian, all of this is by the power and the grace of the uh, Holy Spirit. So to follow Christ means essentially to love God and then to love others. And so that um, living the Christian life is to follow Christ and be committed and devoted to God and believe in God, trust in God. I think that's the main thing, trust in God. And then uh, to live out your trust in love for others and that uh, that's what validates um, our relationship with God is our love for others because if we don't if we don't care about others then I'm not sure we really care about God right it's that saying about loving the God that you can not see but not loving the person that you can something along those lines very profound I have to say and in, in speaking about what we were just talking about, it comes to my mind that obviously the grace of God, the mercy of God is something that uh, one would have to rely on, it would seem to me, in the role such as yours. But along those lines, what has been for you the greatest challenge in serving the Diocese of Stockton? Very diverse, uh, uh, very challenging area of the state as well. I think the... Um greatest challenge uh, in our diocese is to build a parish community amongst all the people. We have such um, a diversity of people, different cultures, ethnic groups, um, uh, economic groups, and so I think the greatest challenge is to build um, community amongst people. And I think we're all struggling with this. I don't think anybody has uh, the answers, uh, but I would say that's the, the greatest challenge. Shifting gears a little bit, what would you say if, if there was a standout among the saints of a saint that really kind of stands out for you, Bishop? Well, of course, I, I'm very devoted to uh, Saint Stephen because uh, he's my patron. I think um, St. Francis de Sales. And why? Because St. Francis de Sales was a, he was the Bishop of Geneva. He was a man of very practical spirituality. Uh, he is the one that uh, said that um, you follow Christ in the setting that you find yourself. So how you follow as the one who's doing the interview how I follow Christ uh, as the one who's being interviewed or the bishop, 
somebody else who is uh, working in a grocery store, that uh, everyone has to follow Christ in his own particular uh, setting. And that, that whatever you do for God, you want to do it uh, well and live your life well, but in your in your circumstances, that every that God places everyone where they are, and uh, I think that's kind of at the heart of His uh, spirituality. You alluded earlier to uh, the the uh, issue of folks maybe in today's world being a greater secularization, and how that sometimes leads to a, a lack of understanding of what faith has to offer. What do you think? in practical terms, we can all do in terms of what, for instance, Pope John Paul II referred to as the new evangelization of re-evangelizing even areas that before used to be very uh, Christian. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned in this that I think the greatest evangelization is the witness of a good life and a good person. I know even myself, when I meet people and I'm impressed by their lives and what they've done. It touches me. And so I, I really believe that the, the first evangelization is the witness of a good life. Uh, somebody who, uh, and they don't have to, somebody who follows Christ, but they don't have to wear their religion on their sleeve. They, they, they are just genuine. And uh, so I, 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 think, I think that would be first. Uh, I think um, I think another way would be um, if we could help people to get beyond their uh, built-in uh, prejudices or uh, life perspectives. Uh, sometimes uh, people will hold on to their own. Um, interpretations rather than being open to allowing God to enter in and maybe perhaps modify. Uh, so I, I think I, I believe greatly in, in inviting people to consider uh, what the scriptures say or consider your position in the light of the gospel. In mention, mentioning St. Francis de Sales, you mentioned something about uh being perhaps the best uh, servant that you can be of the Word of God wherever you are. In that regard, of course, every diocese and archdiocese has its particular characteristics. And now focusing on the Diocese of Stockton, which is where you serve as bishop, what advice, dare I say, would you give to your successor about coming and serving in the Diocese of Stockton? Uh, well, of words of you, you have, yeah, well, that's, uh, I'm not sure I have those words of wisdom. I'm always cautious about uh, giving advice, but I, I think I would say that um, what, what I have enjoyed about this diocese, uh, and I think it would be true of any diocese, is the people. We want to at least be with them. Uh, we may not always be able to, church can't solve a lot of problems of people, but the church can always be with people. And uh, the, the church, concept of a comp accompaniment. Of accompaniment, yes. And, and can stand with people. And I, I really, uh, I subscribe very much to what I think are the the two main principles from the Vatican Council's pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. That what the church, first of all, is to offer to the world the light of Christ. That Christ is a light. Uh, that there is a light in the gospel message. And the second is to uh, accompany people and work with people to accomplish good. Uh, uh, accompaniment, uh, yes, there are, you have to also go beyond that. You have to be a partner with people in uh, working for good. And so I, I, those are what I think were the two fundamental principles from that uh, document that I've always tried to adhere to. As we wind up our interview, is there anything that you would like to add that 
perhaps we haven't touched upon? I guess I would say that we're living in very uh, turbulent uh, times. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, politically, there's a lot going on in civil society, and there's a lot uh, going on uh, in the church, and that we should not be afraid that we should not be afraid because um, it is important that in, the, that in the light of the gospel and trusting in God that we try to sort out um, what we are about and uh, that, that uh, this is God's church, uh, put our trust in God but we have to, there are a lot of things we have to work out in the church, which is fine. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that Christ is the head of the church. And uh, so we, we want to, we always want to be reforming ourselves as members of the church to be more in conformity with Christ. Not just to be in conformity with Christ, but so that we can bring Christ in, uh, into the world and, uh, and make a difference in transforming uh, the world. The church, has, uh, the church has a place in the world in the transformation of the world, making the world uh, more peaceful, making for a just world. Uh, we cannot just sit uh, on the sidelines and uh, uh, we didn't talk very much about the kingdom of God, but uh, the rule of God or the kingdom of God is uh, where we are committed uh, to, the, to the reign of God in our world and that all that that kingdom stands for, which is justice and mercy and peace and goodness. Well, those are very comforting words. I'm glad I asked that last question. Excellency, thank you so very thank much you. for your Joseph, time today. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Shalom World brings to you the Catholic faith in all its different dimensions. It can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Shalom World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved, to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shalom World, God's own channel.